Wow. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started with this presentation. Um, let me share my screen here. All right, uh, with that, I should be in full screen mode. Um, I don't have, while I'm in full screen, I'm not seeing the uh, chat window or the Q&A window. So if you've got comments, uh, feel free to uh, post them in the chat window as we go, uh, but I won't be able to respond to them. If you have specific questions, uh, I recommend posting those to the Q&A window and we'll look at that uh, at the end. Uh, without further ado, uh, let me go into the agenda of items that we'll cover today. <clears throat> so I'm going to start by just going uh, a little bit of an overview of S4, uh, some of the history and where we're at today, uh, talk about some design considerations, including uh, both boost and glide, as well as recovery issues. Uh, as uh, for this event, recovery of the model is uh, very important. Uh, so we'll cover that as well. I'll talk about two of the sort of popular versions of S4. Uh, a few people fly slide wing models, but by far the dominant design uh, is scissors flop. So we'll uh, spend time mostly talking about that one. Uh, we'll talk about models from other countries around the world, some auxiliary or ancillary issues, and we'll wrap up with Q&A. Let me do a little bit of history uh, as best I understand it. The, in the early, early days, uh, S4, which stands for the Space Model Competition Class 4, 
Uh, it was equivalent to the NAR boost glider event. So you could have pop pods, or it could be a rocket glider, or it could have radio control, or it could basically do pretty much anything you wanted. But eventually it became a uh, free flight only event. It uh, became very awkward when there was uh, some uh, countries developed internally carried gliders that go inside of say 30 or 40 millimeter diameter uh, body tube. The glider gets ejected at Apogee. And then there's this tiny little thing way up in the sky. So it's really hard to see. Uh, the timers would have a hard time seeing it even with binoculars. But more critically, you couldn't really tell if the glider was gliding. Uh, it might have just been kind of floating around in the wind. So in terms of saying, hey, is that glider really a glider? Uh, these tiny internally carried gliders became a big problem. So uh, the S4 rules were updated in order to e eliminate anything ejectable. So it's now uh, an NAR rocket glider event that everything that goes up uh, must come back gliding. Um, there hasn't been too many really recent uh, rule changes. The semi-recent changes is that there used to be a minimum mass requirement. Uh, that was part of the effort uh, to try to eliminate the tiny glider problem. Uh, but that sort of got carried over in the rules for a little bit, but now it's gone because it's uh, switching over to an RG type event eliminates the need to have a minimum mass. Uh, there still is a maximum mass rule, which for S4A is 60 grams, which is <laughs> kind of a brick. <clears throat> you would never be competitive with that. So it's not really clear why there's a maximum mass rule, but there is, but nobody ever checks that when you check in your, your models. Uh, one somewhat recent development is that uh, you are permitted uh, to use a one channel of radio control to activate a thermalizer. Uh, you can't use the RC for anything during uh, the free flight portion of the flight, but only to activate a DT uh, either after the max or uh, whenever you choose to activate the dethermalizer. You might uh, potentially want to activate it earlier just to recover the model or something like that. Um, one consideration is that radio control DT may be more reliable and safer uh, than uh, the classic slow burn uh, fuses like the old SIG fuse. Uh, when we were in Romania for the European Championships, I think they had three different uh, grass fires that were either caused by European smoking out there or it was caused by uh, fuses, uh, dethermalizer fuses starting grass fire. So uh, that's bad. So uh, radio control is probably the way to go. But uh, radio control you need a receiver, you need a battery, you need some sort of actuator or burn wire. That's all mass. So it's kind of kind of hard to say if uh, that's really a good thing or not. S4 has a range of motor impulse categories. So you could fly S4B or S4D or S4F. Nobody ever does. Uh, S4A is the only event uh, that I've ever seen flown at either a continental or a world championships. One of the reasons is there is an FAI medal uh, for the annual best performance by a rocketeer uh, where there's this uh, a procedure in the FAI code for how to calculate the best uh, annual performance. It's kind of like the how you did in your best three flights or best three contests over the year, uh, somewhat weighted by how many uh, participants there were at that contest. So you have to do well at big contests in order to score a good score. But that uh, medal is for S4A. There's no corresponding medal for S4B or C or any of the impulse events. So basically, there's a whole lot of uh, motivation to fly S4A. No motivation at all to fly other ones unless you just enjoy that for some reason. The more recent development is to try to limit the impulse to just half A's uh, because A motors require big fields and you lose a lot of models. And the thought is it would actually be better uh, to limit to half A. Uh, you'd recover your model more often. But even so, uh, we found that in the events that we have flown half A uh, or S4 half A, it's still a very competitive event. And in some respects, it's even more challenging to fly half A and do well at that uh, than it is to do A motors. 
Um, just to summarize the rules overall that the an S4 model must ascend vertically. Uh, there's mention of a 60 degree cone, which again, I've never seen anybody actually check. Uh, you could probably use that to DQ somebody if you needed to. But the main thing is that you can't have a circling lifting uh, vehicle, sort of like the old JetX models, if anybody remembers those. Uh, for uh, descent, uh, you have to be gliding. Uh, you can't eject anything. Uh, the a relatively recent rule is that you must enter a stable glide um, or stable descent within 30 seconds or otherwise they'll be dequeued. Uh, now, exactly what a stable glide is, is not well defined. Uh, if my glider is stalling a bit and then it stalls and then recovers and stalls again and recovers. Well, is that stable glide or not? Uh, so I think in the US that we would say, hey, if it's, if it's gliding reasonably well, you're okay. Uh, in European standards, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, it seems to work. Um, what they don't want to do is tie up timers for like five minutes waiting for something to happen. Uh, and so, so far, this 30 second rule seems to uh, be reasonably uh, interpreted and seems to work. You have three rounds, uh, standard rounds. Each round is a three minute max. You only get two models to fly those three rounds. So you pretty much have to get at least one of them back uh, in order to fly the three rounds. If there's a tie after three rounds, there's one fly-off round with a 300-second or a five-minute max. If it's still tied after that, uh, there's one more round uh, with unlimited time. So uh, getting models back uh, can be a premium for some of those. Uh, let me move into design considerations uh, for S4 rocket glider models. Uh, these are sort of big picture items, so bear with me. Uh, the fundamental item is that a fixed geometry glider that's trimmed for glide will not boost right, that uh, the forces that hold up the model in horizontal uh, motion will cause the rocket to loop around uh, quite violently, usually loop around into the ground. So basically a fixed geometry glider will not work for S4. Uh, unless your name is Keith Vineyard. Uh, he did that uh, uh, R&D project that's uh, shown there at the bottom on how you can, under certain circumstances, have no moving part rocket gliders. That requires immense uh, practice and efforts for trimming and getting everything just right. Uh, and generally speaking, I would not recommend that approach for uh, S4A. So in order to have a good S4A model, you really need to have some kind of geometry change, control surface change, mass change, or mass CG uh, position changes in order to go uh, from a something that will boost straight into something that will glide well. And uh, obviously, you can have combinations of these uh, various changes. Well, there's a huge variety of things that have been tried over the years or are available uh, in terms of what can work. Um, you can do pop-up elevators on your empennage. Uh, early days did a bunch of slide pods or just the motor mass shift. Uh, swing wings were popular at one time. Uh, a whole lot of people have put an effort into making uh, wing flap models work, uh, which is sort of the various derivatives of Bob Parks's design called a hummingbird, but a whole lot of people have put a whole lot of time in hummingbirds and uh, had a whole lot of frustration with them. Uh, so they are, anyway, uh, th they're a possibility out there. Uh, more popular ones, at least in NAR styles, like the uh, slide wings, um, you can have the wing slide all the way back to the horizontal stabilizer or perhaps uh, just a partial travel back there. Uh, people have done flop wings, have done scissors wings, but the most popular right now are the combination effects where either you have like a slide wing uh, with a pop-up elevator or maybe a curved fuselage, or you have a scissors wing, but also with flop wings. And uh, as we'll see that the uh, scissors flop just dominates S4. 
The uh, critical part about getting from boost to glide is that you have to have the correct uh, pitch stability uh, derivatives. I'm going to flip here to the next chart. Uh, here's a bunch of equations and pictures uh, showing you what the mathematics are for how to calculate uh, longitudinal or pitch stability in horizontal flight. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, whoops, where are we going here? There we are. Um, <clears throat> Typically, you get the transition to glide by having the some incidence between the wing and the horizontal stabilizer. So either the uh, horizontal stabilizer elevators at a negative incident, or you can put the wing at a positive incidence. And that turns out to be a really handy thing for scissor swings because uh, when you've got positive incidence on the wing in a glide position, when you scissors or rotate the wing around, that becomes merely kind of a left-right uh, eccentricity, which really doesn't affect your boost hardly at all. So for scissor flop designs, uh, this the scissoring motion makes it a lot easier to make the incident effect go away uh, during boost, and it makes it easy for uh, S4A scissor flop models to boost very straight. Uh, one thing to talk about here, this is the horizontal orientation, but if your rocket glider happened to be pitched down uh, when the wings uh, move or whatever activation goes on, uh, the equations are slightly different uh, depending on the actual orientation. And in a nose down condition, it becomes even harder for the glider to uh, recover. So you may need more incidents uh to get a hundred percent guarantee of a transition uh than you might expect and we'll talk about that um again any incidence effects will cause a loop in the ground the way the slide wing suppresses this is by sliding the wing aft such that the moment arm uh, between the incidence in the tail to where the wing is located uh, that moment arm is basically uh, pretty close to zero. So the pitch moment from the uh, tail incident uh, goes away significantly. Uh, another way of doing that is to get your negative incident by a pop-up elevator. So you just hold the elevator down during boost. You've got a burn string or something uh, that releases it for glide. Uh, so you can get the same effect either with a pop-up elevator or uh, you could do wing flaps that you could have the wing flaps held up uh, for a boost, and you have them drop down for glide. Uh, as I mentioned, the scissors flop wings, that the scissoring uh, rotates the wing incident out of, out, of, out of the pitch plane, so uh, scissors flop uh, gliders typically go very, very straight. The transition, uh, how much incidence do you need? Uh, if you've got a sort of a standard boost glider, not a rocket glider, boost gliders typically work well on as low as one degree incidence or one to two degree incidence. Uh, rocket gliders or S4 models seem to need more. Uh, three degrees incidence for uh, slide wing models seems to be good. But I've had S uh, scissors plot models with three degrees of incidence just do death dives. And I've been building everything recently with five degrees. And that seems to work. Haven't had any problems with five, but five always looks like, wow, that's a lot of incidence. You really need that? And right now, I would say, yeah, if you want 100% reliability for glide transition, you need a lot of incidents, more than you might think. Um, for uh, recovery, uh, there's a lot of things you can do to help recovery. Uh, obviously, you've got to make three flights uh, generally to be competitive and you only get two models to do that with in the first three rounds. So you really need to get at least one of them back. Uh, the obvious way of doing that is to make your model a lot more visible. If you've got a bare balsa model out in a field of grass or hay, it's gonna be really hard to see. So uh, Sharpies, uh, red, orange, yellow, whatever, uh, something that's quite visible or pink. We'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, you can add silver mylar tape, uh, gold trim from uh, or 
the gold trim monocoat, uh, it's pretty light as well. Uh, you got to make sure you uh, get both the upper and lower surfaces because uh, you do need to have your glider visible in the air, but when it lands, you don't know if it's going to land, you know, which surface is going to be pointed up. Uh, adding all this marking typically doesn't add much weight to your model. The pink marker uh, was awarded to me, I think, by uh, the deep recovery team, particularly Brian Muzek, in honor of why don't you color your model a little better so it makes it easier to find. But uh, we'll go over that story a little bit more uh, later on. Uh, obviously, one other trick that you could use for getting your model back are the thermalizers, but we'll talk more about that shortly. Uh, let me, I'm going to review two classes of S4 models, um, and I'm going to start with slide wing models. The reason I'm going to talk about uh, both of these is that both of these models are competitive, and while the scissor flop tends to dominate, that uh, slide wings, uh, you know, we might be aware of them. Also, scissors flops until some recent developments have been uh, often very frustrating to get 100% reliability that sometimes uh, the flop wings don't unflop, and in which case your glider just spirals down and crashes into the ground. Uh, whereas slide wing models basically have one or maybe two moving parts they're very reliable because all you got to do is have a burn, uh, little threads burn by the ejection charge. So slide wing models do have uh, simplicity and reliability as potential advantages. Uh, on the left hand picture, there's uh, two uh, variants of slide wings. Uh, the one at the top or sort of in the back of the picture that uses a fuselage made out of three stacked uh, graphite tubes. So the tube diameter is 078 and the uh, height, uh, therefore the, the width of the uh, fuselage there is 078, the height is three times 078. So it's very stiff uh, vertically, uh, pretty stiff laterally, but the stacked tubes also give something for the wing slide box to go around. Uh, by using a stacked uh, graphite tubes like this, you don't have to have the auxiliary plate, either uh, plywood or fiberglass or whatever. Uh, you don't need that auxiliary plate like you would if you had the uh, classic uh, T slide uh, type sliding wing arrangement. The glider on the bottom and also shown, uh, same glider shown on the right hand side, uh, that uses a curved fuselage. So uh, you can kind of see the curvature in the right-hand side. The reason to have the curvature is so that the wing will be at zero incidence when it's way in the back. And as the wing slides forward, then it will come up to whatever positive incidence you want to have. Uh, in this case, uh, this particular glider was set to three degrees and it's worked perfectly every time. Um, the weight of the glider that I'm sort of holding there in the hand, that's about a 12 and a half grams for the glider. So it's not, not a bad weight, uh, but as you see, we can get a little bit lighter than that. One of the reasons it's a little bit heavy is you do need a uh, you know a big wood fuselage and you also need the uh, slide box. Uh, in this case, I'm using a 3D printed slide box that's gonna be shown in a little bit more detail. Uh, this picture here shows uh, another one of the gliders that has the pop-up elevator and the graphite uh, fuselage. So you can get modest wingspans on a slide wing, but since the wings aren't tucked in, uh, this type of design is somewhat more prone to uh, flutter or uh, diversion. So you would uh, shred your wings going up if the uh, wingspan is too high. Just talking a few details about the glider design. Uh, I typically build mine with uh, eighth inch balsa. If I'm feeling busy or uh, aggressive that day, I might taper the thickness down towards the tip. Uh, sometimes I feel lazy and I don't. Uh, so um, the airfoil thickness is probably about right in the center and maybe a little on the thick side uh, towards the tip. 
not necessarily great practice, but it seems to work, so it's okay. Uh, if you're feeling aggressive, you can go with thinner. That has a potential for shredding on the way up. Uh, so uh, it all depends on how, you know, the quality of the wood and uh, how you build your models. A uh, little bit of app sweep will help. You might notice that uh, all these gliders have sort of roughly uh, straight trailing edges and somewhat swept uh, leaning edges. And that's in order to uh, help a little bit with flutter and divergence to make sure the wing survives boost. If we all switch to half A motors uh, permanently, uh, that might allow for a little bit uh, larger wingspans or aspect ratio. Uh, horizontal stabilizer, 16th inch uh, balsa. And uh, a lot of discussion about covering back in the old days when it seemed like we had infinite time that uh, we did a lot of uh, covering with Japanese tissue. Uh, that does add strength, but it does also add some mass. And the classic Isaki tissue, I think, is out of production, although I've still got a bunch in the garage. But uh, good tissue is getting harder to find as time goes by. You can do other types of paints or aerogloss dope. That adds mass. I, my trend is just uh, fly naked. Why not? And uh, it seems to work unless it rains that day, in which case I'll be out of luck. But uh, so far, it's uh, worked out pretty well. The fuselage for the slide wing, again, here, uh, if you do the graphite approach, uh, the stack tubes, you can either do two tubes or three or four or whatever you want. Uh, what I found is that the if you only use two tubes and you've got some uh, elbow room for the slide box to slide around the tubes without jamming up, uh, the left to right or the sort of the roll precision of where the wing winds up isn't that great. And if you have a, for example, if you have a pop-up elevator and the wing's at an angle or the horizontal stabilizer's at a kind of a weird angle relative to the wing, the glider may uh, go into a fairly tight turn. You get better precision if you go to three tubes, uh, that will give better uh, roll position of the wing uh, in its deployed condition. If you go with curved fuselages, you could use spruce. Uh, I typically use light ply. Uh, light ply is also getting a little harder to find, but you can uh, order from places like Tower Hobbies and still get it. Uh, the nice thing about the curved fuselage is that you no longer have a pop-up elevator. Uh, so that uh, simplifies some construction, also simplifies prepping the model uh, because with a pop-up elevator, you have two burn strings, one for the wing, and one for the elevator. With uh, this one, you'd only need uh, one string just for the wing. Uh, you could also, as I mentioned, uh, go with the old uh, T-slide approach. Uh, I haven't done that in a while myself, so I don't know. For the slide box, uh, I mentioned I'm doing 3D printing. Uh, it's pretty light. Uh, the little 3D printer I've got can print very thin parts, so they're pretty light. Uh, if you got a laser cutter, uh, you can do like in the uh, Apogee Cirrus Breeze kit. Uh, they've got a very clever, uh, I'm pretty sure it's plywood uh, wing box there. Or, gosh, you could actually make it yourself. Uh, it could be done. But uh, some of these other techniques are uh, a lot easier and, and more precise. Here's a couple of pictures of some 3D printed parts. Um, the slide box there is two pieces. There's kind of a, a left-hand and a right-hand side piece. You can glue them together so that the uh, glue never gets inside uh, the wing box. So uh, you got nice smooth surfaces there. And uh, there's an arrow pointing to the thread attach horn or hook. Uh, that's just printed right as part of the uh, part. Uh, so it's, it's ready. Red'll already done as soon as you put the wing box together. I do use uh, masking tape or that blue masking tape around the front. That serves both as a where to stop the wing in order to get the wing at the right uh, trim location, but it also does uh, absorb the shock of the wing slapping forward and hitting the stop there. So rather than having a piece of wood or graphite or something else, uh, just wrap some tape around the fuselage and that works great. Uh, on the right-hand picture, there's a little 
uh, thread guide where the wing thread would go aft, go through that hole, and then back up forward in order to go through the pod uh, for the wing holdback thread. Let's talk a little bit more about transition since that's really critical. Um, if you had a flat bottom airfoil as shown on the right and you move that flat uh, to the uh, your, uh, your slide box, uh, you'd have about one to two degrees of incidence, uh, kind of depending on exactly what airfoil you're using. Again, that could work, but, but it probably won't. Because uh, if the glider doesn't come out in a perfect orientation, uh, it'll uh, that small degree of incidence will probably not be sufficient to transition your glider and down you go in a death dive. Uh, the other methods uh, we've already talked about, so pop-up elevator, uh, held down during boost, release for ejection, or the curved fuselage approach. Uh, either one of those will give you uh, very high reliability for uh, transitioning from boost to glide. All right, let me talk about scissors flop models for a bit. This is the uh, miracle glider that uh, I used at the World Champs this year, and the miracle part is not its performance, but that it's still here. Uh, after four rounds, so three standard rounds plus four plus the flyoff round, I still have this model, and it's uh, all due to the U.S. Deep Recovery Team, uh, particularly uh, Chris Kidwell and Brian Music, that did a lot of uh, spotting and tramping out in the field, including. Uh, and you can note here that this is a lot of uh, natural balsa surface here that. Uh, uh, one time this landed right in the middle of a patch of hay and Chris Kedwell said he probably walked by where it landed about three or four times prior to him actually spotting it since, uh, since I did uh, do what I said and put a whole lot of uh, highlighters or markings on this side. Uh, and that's why uh, Brian presented to me the uh, legendary pink marker uh, that shall be used for all future gliders. <clears throat> which I'm not sure if I'm going to stay with pink, but, but I will uh, use orange or yellow or something a little bit brighter uh, in the future. Uh, some features of uh, scissors flop designs. You can typically have uh, larger wingspans than you could with a slide wing. Uh, the model I'm using right now has about an 18 inch wingspan. I've seen other S4A models that are even bigger than that. Uh, what's the right wingspan? I don't know. We'll talk about that. Uh, again, sort of the same type of balsa wood. So start with eighth inch, maybe 332nd. Uh, I typically use a plan form that's just a straight taper. That's uh, say about two and a half or three inches cord in the center. Uh, usually about 60% of that out of the wingtip. Uh, so if you have like two and a half in the center, might maybe one and a half inches out at the tip. Uh, straight taper is just very easy to airfoil, so that's one reason I do it that way. Uh, same issues for horizontal stabilizer and for covering that, uh, again, flying naked seems to work unless you get a bad day, which it doesn't. Uh, as far as the fuselage goes, there's several options here that um, for, you. The one that I typically use is a uh, 098 uh, graphite tube. You could move up to a 120 tube with only a little bit of additional mass, and that provides you even more stiffness and strength. I've tried smaller individual tubes like 078. They just seem way too flexible. They don't work well. For the wing pivot, uh, a lot of people use a metal screw and a nut. Uh, I haven't personally figured out exactly how to do this on a good basis because uh, with a screw, you either have to drill through a larger graphite tube, which always scares me, or you would have to cut the tube, put in uh, whatever pivot mechanism you want, and then sort of splice the two back together again. I've gone with a design based on aluminum tubes, uh, your standard KNS aluminum tubes you can buy at the hobby store or the internet. Uh, so you've got a central axle that then a larger tube that gets glued into the wing uh, that 
wing tube then just slides onto the axle tube. Uh, the axle tube has a hole uh, sort of hand drilled uh, for the fuselage, and we'll see a picture of that just momentarily. Uh, so the uh, center fuselage tube remains intact. The uh, axle tube just slides over and get glued onto the fuselage. Wing tube just slides onto that. And then you need just a little retention pin uh, to hold the wing onto all of that assembly. Uh, and I do use some assembly jigs for uh, accuracy. Here's some pictures of the... Um, the wing pivot that I'm using. Uh, so again, there's an aluminum tube serving as the axle. I drill a hole into that and I can either use like a Dremel tool, but oftentimes what I'll do is I actually start the hole just with an X-Acto knife. Uh, so you'll sort of get a, a little bit of a dull X-Acto knife and then just start uh, twirling that around until you've actually drilled a hole. So there's a variety of ways of doing that, but basically uh, you make the holes so they're big enough where you can slide the tube through there. And then I use an assembly jig to glue that axle to the fiber or to the graphite uh, fuselage tube uh, so that that axle tube is perfectly uh, perpendicular to the uh, graphite tube. And you can see a little bit of five minute epoxy kind of sitting there in the center of the axle tube. Uh, on the two pictures on the right, that's kind of looking on the top surface of the wings. So you can make a retention pin that's either uh, a couple of nested aluminum tubes. Uh, you can make a little 3D printed tube. You could probably use a piece of a nylon screw. Uh, any of those would work fine. The, an example in the lower left hand is a picture of how one of the Russian design does it. Uh, looks like it's got a screw that goes into sort of a blind fastener down there. And there's some interesting paraphernalia. But anyway, we'll see more of that uh, later on. But uh, it's, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, so there's aspects of uh, the aluminum tube method that I prefer. Uh, one of the more tricky parts about uh, scissors flop designs is the flop part. Uh, you need hinges. And you need some way to make sure that the flop wings will always unflop. Um, in order to do that, uh, you need hinges. Uh, I typically use one ounce Kevlar fabric that you bond to the wing. Uh, in the old days, you'd use um, Ambroid. Uh, that's out of production. So I've switched to tight bond. Tight bond sounds like a terrible solution, but it works well. Um, usually I use a, the... Uh, double glue approach where you sort of put a little bit of tight bond down on the, the balsa wood, uh, rub that in and let it dry. And then you put the hinge down uh, with more glue and then uh, let that dry. And once it's totally dry, then you can uh, sort of crack the hinge and uh, it should be just fine. An alternative is you use Tyvek tape. Uh, that's got a really aggressive adhesive on it, but it even with that, uh, if there's any force on the tape, such as rubber bands or anything else, it will creep over time. So uh, I prefer something that's bonded to the wing, uh, if that's feasible. For the flop wing deployment, uh, rubber bands work most of the time, but not 100% of the time. So you need something better. Um, and options are uh, torque bars. Uh, Don Carson's done some great work in this area. Uh, they have a problem with torque bars where uh, it's really hard to get them to go through a full 180 degree or even 210 degree uh, motion without going past the uh, yield point of the metal. Uh, so an alternate, uh, well, Dom's got a method for a longer music, sort of a double length uh, torque bar, but an even simpler method was something that Trip Barber came up with that I'll call the belt and suspenders approach, where you don't try to get the torque bar to go 200, you know, 180 degrees or 210. You just have it be for about the initial 90 degrees of deployment. And after that, the rubber bands take over. And that procedure, uh, it works great. Uh, I use it at the World Champs. Uh, Kevin Cusick used it at the World Champs. Um, I think Ryan used it also. And we all had perfect deployment.
So uh, this belt and suspenders approach, uh, that's the way I'm going for the time being at least. Uh, talk about the scissors rotation. Uh, typically this is fairly simple. You've just got a rubber band going up to the pylon. Uh, what I do is I've got the rubber band going to the wing stop a uh, little post that uh, gets glued to the wing just to say where the wing should stop rotating. And just having the wing stop also serve as the rubber band hook works great. Uh, I'm not, if you look at a bunch of the European designs, the rubber band uh, hook is way out on the wing, like a couple, two, three, four inches uh, outboard from the center line. I've never really understood why. So uh, I just put it on that center post and life goes on. It's perfect. I uh, talked about using jigs for accurate assembly. Uh, these are some CAD pictures of stuff I've built, but these allow you to put the wing at the prescribed, uh, the wing and the wing tube at the incidence you want. Uh, that center uh, kind of Y looking thing is how I, uh, for the slide wings, that's how I uh, orient the wing relative to the slide box. Uh, you could do that by eye, but uh, jigs are better. Uh, the complicated looking thing down in the lower right uh, is probably more complicated than it really needs to be. There's a reason I made it that way, but it's mostly to uh, minimize material use for, at the time. But that's just uh, two tubes where you can, uh, the longitudinal direction is the fuselage tube. Uh, the perpendicular direction is the axle tube. So that just use that to uh, glue the two together. And there's some clearance in the center so that you don't glue the two parts to the fixture. So uh, 3D printing makes these jigs really easy. Obviously, you can make them by hand as well, but uh, whatever works. But jigs are jigs are very happy, very good for making accurate models. All right, I'm going to review some models. I'm going to start with the uh, Wayback Machine. Uh, here's a couple of fun uh, pictures from the old MIT Composition Design book. Uh, on the left is a little one. If you remember, any of you old timers out there remember Nat uh events and hornets and sparrows and all the various impulse categories so there's a nat rocket glider that was a pop-up elevator plus engine shift uh jeff landis like the slide pod approach shown there on the right uh here's two more uh again a slide pod on this right from jeff and on the left, left is a design by guppy for a slide wing uh of these i would say the uh, Guppy's design might still be still competitive, um, but uh, again, the uh, scissor flop tends to dominate the environments these days. Let's talk about more modern times. One of the uh, great designs uh, was by Venus Rocketry and Mark Petrovich. Uh, this particular design got a lot of people going in S4 type uh, rocket glider models. It also had a weird behavior that sometimes it would boost just perfectly and other times it would go in a big corkscrew. Never quite understood that. But uh, it was a great model for really getting a whole lot of people introduced to the event. Right now, if you want to fly an S4A model, the uh, Apogee Cirrus Breeze Kit will do the job. Um, it's got some very clever uh, laser cutting for the slide box, for and a, uh, several very nice templates for gluing the wing together uh, or fixtures for you know, making sure all the panels are in the right place. So uh, this is a great kit, a great way for somebody that uh, wants to get started right away with a flyable model. All right, here's a slide wing model. Uh, and while S uh, scissor slot models dominate, S uh, slide wing models can be competitive. Uh, this model actually finished in sixth place uh, at the European Championships in 2019, and for a while it was in first place. So it's kind of kind of fun to see uh, this model on the leaderboard at least for a while. Uh, this is another picture of the S4A model I showed earlier, the scissor slot model. Here's a Russian design. And one thing you might notice is that all of the scissors flop models typically kind of all start looking the same. Uh, if any of you are familiar with uh, 
uh, what are called discus launch gliders or uh, F3K gliders that after a while, they all sort of start looking the same. Uh, they might have different paint patterns, but they all kind of have the same wing plan forms and they're, it's just sort of variations on a theme for the most part. Uh, here's a couple of models from Poland. Uh, these are maybe a little larger wingspan than those other ones, but again, they all start looking kind of the same. Uh, for those of you with uh, deep pockets, uh, you might want to buy these models from Russia. Um, that uh, 70 euros translates to about 80 bucks, I think. I don't know if that includes shipping, but uh, anyway, it's, it's very high technology model. It's got graphite fuselage. At one time it had graphite wings. I'm not sure if this one does or not. I assume it does. But uh, yeah, it's a very advanced uh, technology. So uh, just some observations from in general that uh, again, scissor swap is the dominant design. You will occasionally see something else more often than not, it's an American. But uh, I actually have seen some Europeans fly something other than S4, or uh, other than scissor flop, but not very often. So again, once you're into scissor flop, they all sort of like, they all look the same, uh, other than maybe some tweaks in uh, how, what aspect ratio are you using, what wingspan are you using. Um, with half A models, there might be a a uh, bit of a change in terms of, well, for half A, do I do a bigger model, a smaller model? Maybe I would fly exactly the same model. I don't know. Uh, there's some more use of composite materials. Uh, the Russian uh, model there, uh, Keith Vineyard and Kevin Kuzik has also done some. Uh, I remember seeing one from the UK that was just a magnificent piece of technology that completely failed during flight, but uh, their construction was in immensely impressive. And again, uh, there's some use of 3D printing, mostly for auxiliary things uh, like thread guides or assembly jigs. Uh, let me wrap up with a couple of ancillary items. Um, if you're launching in windy conditions, uh, you might need these support posts in order to keep too much bending moment from sort of binding up either uh, the vehicle on the launch rod or the vehicle on a uh, piston or rail. Uh, one thing you do want is you want the horizontal stabilizer to come off of its guide post at the same time the rest of the rocket comes off the launch rod or the piston. Uh, so some sizing is important. I uh, talked to, said I would talk a little bit about dethermalizers. Um, there's this thing called in uh, professional aerospace called TRL or military or any sort of uh, day job type stuff where TRL stands for technology readiness level. And it seems like all of the technologies for dethermalizers, everybody says we ought to have better dethermalizers. And yet it's always like, yeah, yeah, we should work on that, but nothing quite gets to the right technology readiness level where I would actually put it on a, a competition glider at a major contest. Uh, I know Matt's doing some work with the uh, Adrol Max Deploy or whatever it's called. Uh, that might work, but it's always a trade-off between how do you activate it, what's the mass, what's the battery, what's the dethermalizer method. But uh, as time goes by, there will probably finally be an electronic solution uh, that will work. So maybe we're getting closer, but... Uh, I haven't seen that used on a regular basis yet. Um, for S4, glide is important, but obviously your boost altitude is also important. So pistons can help or they can help grip your model apart. Uh, there's a lot of work done on uh, S6 models, the uh, streamer duration, where they don't piston launch because they build the model so light that the extra velocity from a piston launch might crush the nose cone or shred the rest of the model. Uh, S4 models can perhaps get in the same category. So you sort of need to decide whether you want a piston launch or not. Uh, one thing that I have seen is that slide wing models are aerodynamically cleaner in boost than scissors flop models, so they will boost higher. But typically, they don't quite glide quite as well. So it's a trade-off between boost altitude and uh, glide performance. 
the most one of the most important things you can do there is that last bullet for use a checklist. Uh, I've had flights, and I'm sure others have too, where, gosh, I forgot to put on that rubber band. Gosh, I forgot to take that piece of tape off. You know, whatever. So always use a checklist to improve your reliability. And lastly here that uh, there's always the effort for saying, well, I'm going to win by having improved performance. So uh, you get there by having a lighter, as light as possible, but not to the point where it breaks. Uh, better airfoils are typically very thin and cambered uh, at low Reynolds numbers. Thin airfoils and cambered airfoils are difficult. They're hard to they're hard to create. They're hard to make flop wings out of things like that. So uh, the best airfoils are also the most complicated airfoils. Um, one other thing, uh, this is something Bob Parks likes to harp on, is uh, basically don't forget the drag part. You know, everybody thinks about lift and all that, but uh, the drag coefficient is very important as well. You can get somewhat less induced drag by going to higher aspect ratio. Uh, you can uh, reduce uh, parasitic drag by getting rid of rubber bands and rubber band hooks and all that kind of stuff if you were to switch to torque bars. Um, but there's some, again, the belt and suspenders approach is just totally reliable. So it again, a trade-off. Uh, Steve and Terrell and others have mentioned the importance of air. Air is also very critical for S4. But then there's the issue of uh, all these issues with uh, better materials. There's this old phrase that Americans build stuff and you know, they're always tinkering, but Europeans just go out and fly and get good at flying. So uh, there's also always a trade-off between uh, trying to have the best model versus also not having a brick. So always look for that trade-off there. All right, I'm going to wrap up here with uh, some words of wisdom from Jeff Landis, where uh, and this is uh, sort of the closing from the introduction for the, the uh, MIT competition uh, book. But these, these words still are very applicable today. Be a good sportsman. Love your fellow competitor. All good words. All right, with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'll go look at the uh, Q&A and see what's going on there. All right, uh, item here, Bob Park says there's probably an optimum aspect ratio. I would agree. Don't know what it is. So uh, anybody that wants to keep tinkering out there, that uh, that's an open item. Uh, thoughts on the viability of sliding flap wing. Um, I've tried that myself. One issue that the uh, sliding flap wing. Well, maybe I'm thinking of a different design. I've looked at uh, uh, adjustable flaps similar uh, to those on the Hummingbird. Uh, one problem is that a lot of the parts get very thin. And I've heard like buzzing on the way up. So that gets uh, scary uh, thin. So uh, certainly you can play around with it uh, and see if that you can get one to work well. Mark Bundick says, got a source for graphite tubes. Um, the best place I go to is CST Technologies. And also on some of the slides there, there was a reference uh, to a page on the NAR site uh, under the International Competition Second uh, for materials and techniques. There's a whole bunch of links to various vendors for uh, fiberglass fabric, uh, tubes, um, resins, all kinds of stuff. So be sure to check the website for that. Uh, Terry Dean says, since we'll be using half a engines, should we, should we consider downsizing our gliders? I don't know. Uh, that's another good question, and uh, I suspect the answer is probably yes, but maybe no. Uh, people need to go out and build models and fly and find out, so I don't know. Uh, Brian Music, yes, Isaki is out of, the Isaki tissue is out of production, but there's an alternate one from a place called Mount Fuji. I've heard of that, never tried it yet, but yeah, it would probably work if you're a... Uh, tissue uh, enthusiast. 
Brian, what sort of effective dihedral are you running? Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, and there's big rules of, or there's different uh, thoughts on that. Uh, a lot of people nowadays tend to try to go to very low dihedral because they think it looks cool and it looks like the F3K models. What they don't realize is, well, F3K models typically have full span flapper uh, so you can uh, control your model very well. Uh, with free flight models, as Brian notes, that uh, low dihedral can get you into nasty control issues and uh, spiral instability issues. I, for the um, for the slide wing models that uh, are just the two piece assembly, I use uh, 30 degrees as the included angle. So it's 15 degrees under each wing. Uh, for the uh, scissors plot models, I'm probably 30, 30-ish degrees under each panel, which doesn't equate to 30 degrees uh, dihedral but it seems to work. Um, but yeah, you could experiment on that. But yeah, don't don't try to take an S4 model and make it look like an F3K discus launch glider model. That That's a recipe for badness. Uh, Brian Beard, if a burn string separates a model after it burns, if you could see a burn string come off at altitude, uh, you've got much, much better eyes than I have. I think the answer would be no, uh, that uh, I don't think anybody would be able to see that. All right. Uh, I think that's all the questions I've got. Wait, did I miss a few here? Tubes. Uh, okay, there's some other items there. Let's see, Chad Ring. Yeah. All right, Taurus has a comment. Uh, some East Europeans are using under camber. Your thoughts? Uh, that is probably a better airfoil uh, at these Reynolds numbers, but uh, you'd have to do some work in order to make them actually work. <laughs> so uh, they're just hard to build, but yeah, they would be better. All right, I'm looking at uh, the time here, then I've got to end here in 30 seconds. So with that, I think I'll wrap this up for now. Uh, appreciate you all joining me today and uh, hope you enjoyed it. And with that, I'll bid you all adieu. Bye-bye.